I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is with. All of our thoughts are transparent to God, but the Apostle Peter's thoughts were transparent to everyone. I would venture to guess that either his mother didn't drill the maxim to think before you speak into his head, or he just didn't listen. From what we know of Peter, possibly because he was too busy talking over her. I am also guessing his dad didn't tell him that it was better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Peter had been hearing what Jesus said about the church being accepting and welcoming and always dealing with conflict, keeping the goal of reconciliation in mind, and all of us being as one in fellowship with one another in Christ. He had heard Jesus teach of the Lord's Prayer, and in that prayer, we are to ask God to forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. He understood when Jesus taught that the faith that saves us also transforms us so that we are a forgiving people. He had heard the rabbis teach that we should forgive others up to three times. But Jesus had hit the topic of forgiveness so hard, so many times, Peter blurts out, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? How to translate Jesus' answer isn't completely clear. He either said, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times, or I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. Uh, it just depends on what translation you read. Which is the better translation doesn't really matter here. The point being that we forgive others so many times that we lose track of the count as forgiveness becomes our internalized mode of relating to others. Jesus then makes this point by telling the story, the parable of the unmerciful servant. The cast in this story is made up of a king, the big debtor, the little debtor, and the whistleblowers. The day rolls around when the king is ready to balance his books. The big debtor walks in. The king says, you owe, owe me over seven billion dollars. That's the value of 10,000 talents in today's dollars. Big debtor checks his pockets and admits he can't pay. The king orders that he and his family be sold into slavery till the debt is paid, which of course is too enormous to ever be paid. Big debtor freaks out, begging for mercy. The king takes pity on him and forgives his debt. A happy ending? Ah, uh, but the story isn't over. After experiencing this mercy, the guy who owes seven billion dollars walks out and happens upon the little debtor, who owes him about fourteen thousand dollars, the value of a hundred denarii in today's dollars. He grabs the little debtor, chokes him, and insists on payment. The little debtor uses the same words to beg for mercy as the big debtor had, but the big debtor wouldn't hear it. He had the little debtor thrown into jail until his debts would be paid. Now, not only had the big debt been forgiven, but the big debtor could expect passive income as the little debtor's family tried to pay back his debt and buy his freedom. Surely this was the big debtor's happy ending. But there were some whistleblowers among the two debtor's fellow employees who told the king what had happened. That angered the king and he handed the big debtor over to be jailed and tortured until the seven billion dollars was paid off, which of course means forever. In case the point of the story was too subtle, Jesus tells the disciples this is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of you. 
unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. How big was the debt we owed when God forgave us? Could anyone else owe us a debt so great as we owed God? How can we ever be unforgiving when we have been forgiven so much? Ironically for us humans to forgive is to loosen not just the debt bound to the forgiven, but to let go the resentment and hurt we feel toward the offender and our need for the offender to do something to expunge their debt to us. Forgiveness, in other words, is the only way in which we can be free from the burden of our past wounds and resentments. That is what forgiveness is. But there are also misconceptions about what forgiveness is or means. For example, there's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Forgiving someone doesn't mean reconciliation with someone. Last week's reading on dealing with conflict makes that clear. There is a difference between forgiveness and enabling, tolerating or continually subjecting ourselves to the abuse of another person. Again, the Bible's teaching on dealing with conflict means we separate ourselves from those who might continue to harm us or vulnerable ones we are responsible to protect. We must even remove ourselves from, from relationships where our continued presence further enables someone to harm themselves. Likewise, we have a responsibility to go to the authorities when we know such evil is being perpetrated on another, to be the whistleblowers in today's parable. It has been said that unforgiveness is like taking poison and waiting for the other person to die. But letting go of our resentment and hurt over past offenses is far from easy. It is living out our faith, but Jesus often describes that process as bearing our cross it is the work of the Holy Spirit which we must receive. To work through these past offenses, especially if they were tra traumatic, may take years of counseling or therapy, but it is possible to be substantially freed from the burden of resentment. Perhaps we can all take a step in that direction, starting now. Maybe it's time to let it go.